Nobody preamble this week. Welcome down to the bridge. <laughs> it's been a day. It has. For all involved. <laughs> yep. I'm the Scarlet Troll, a.k.a. Cody. And I am Greg. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's get right into it. I got a couple bits of gaming news. Okay. One of which is, are you familiar with the mimetic phenomenon known as Big Chungus? <laughs> I don't like where this is going. <laughs> Would you believe me if I said he might be in multiverses? It's a meme. Why? It's a fucking why? Are, no, 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 that's not okay. <laughs> because in a European Union trademark filing, Warner Brothers has trademarked Big Chungus for use in a video game. I hate this timeline. <laughs> right? I re what the fuck? Of all the things, it's like, yeah, we have all these, like, characters from years and decades of like animation and storytelling or not we're gonna go with the big chungus meme <laughs> of course um, what else would you do now granted <laughs> it's not guaranteed that this is for multiverses because it does not mention multiverses specifically but realistically speaking what else are you gonna do with big chungus video game wise is it bad that i'm actually if the, i don't want it to happen but if it does happen i'd be very curious about big chungus's like move set and how he plays <laughs> Just heavier Bugs Bunny. <laughs> maybe he doesn't I... even move. Maybe he just moves like a cardboard cutout would if somebody was behind it making it walk. Oh, God. I'll tell you what. I, if our friend Chase wasn't interested in the game, if that does happen, he'll definitely be interested after that. <laughs> Quite possibly. Hmm. Can't wait to tell him about this. <laughs> I have some slightly less upsetting game news. Good. Masahiro Sakurai has his own YouTube channel about gaming creation. I actually subscribe to that channel. Same! I still haven't watched anything on it because I'm terrible. Oh, no, but um, my co-worker told me about it and I was like, excuse me? It's like, yeah, he made a YouTube channel. I was like, is this going to be his, how the one writer for Gravity Falls, how he like, um comically documents his fights with Disney, but instead it's Monster I Sakura with Nintendo. Because <laughs> nah. I would be very into that. <laughs> he has said the videos will be focused on topics like game development and what makes games fun. Okay. And he's aiming to keep the videos between two and five minutes long, so... Okay. I mean, that's still really cool. It is. And that's why I hit the subscribe button, because Sakurai is a real G, and I want to support his endeavors. Yeah, like, I don't even do, like, Nintendo products or whatnot, but just knowing all the things he's done, it's still a deal of, okay, no, I this just seems like a really cool educational channel, so I definitely want to be subscribed to this and see what comes of it. And I will remind you, without Sakurai, we wouldn't have the image of Sakurai holding a diamond pickaxe, which is possibly one of the most <laughs> powerful images I've ever seen on the internet. <laughs> Does it resonate with you on a personal level? Not on a personal level, more like... A deep, inherited, primal fear. <laughs> I can't explain it beyond that, though. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see what else comes of that. <laughs> Same. I really need to check some stuff, some of his stuff out this weekend, now that I have time. And by this weekend, I mean my weekend. Fair, yeah. I mean, my, I have a day tomorrow, so maybe I'll watch a video or two. Sounds like a plan. Were those your only bits of gaming news? Yes, do you have something? Ah, uh, something kind of small. There's been some leaks in regards to the upcoming Need for Speed game. Someone recently leaked some what appears to be pre-alpha footage of the game, and it's kind of sent the Need for Speed community into a tizzy. Oh dear. Because what it is, is one of the things that was revealed about the game, and I'm pretty sure I talked about this on a previous episode, is that for this game, which is being made by Criterion, the people who made the Burnout games, as in, and yes, that includes Burnout 3, where we accidentally swapped the total scores we got in the crash mode. God, I hate that! <laughs> Inside joke. It's been kind of hush-hush. It sounds like it's going to be delayed by a month. No con confirmations there. But what it is is that it's someone trying to make a jump. And when they make the jump, they crash. And there's like a kind of graffiti-style skull and crossbones that happen above the car. And there's also like wings that come out. The significance of this is that one of the things that was leaked about the game beforehand is that apparently the art style for the game, while graphically still being very realistic, is going to um, borrow a lot from comic book art, anime art, and graffiti art style. Ooh. Yeah, it's 
I if I could easily link it, I would send you a link of it so you could see it. It's one of those things where honestly, I think it's a little bit charming, but I can definitely see it hurting the gameplay <laughs> more than anything else, especially if it happens all the time and depends on how intrusive it is. On the one hand, debating the artistic integrity of Need for Speed sounds a little fucking silly, but <laughs> then again, I am the person who is very disappointed that there was a big giant kaiju god slugfest in the end episode of Moon Knight. So, mm, you know, a little fucking silly is kind of right up my alley. <laughs> I mean, so far, nothing's been shown as silly as that. No, I mean, it's one of those things where you can definitely find it online because this clip, it's like a 10 second clip of a Chevy Bel Air trying to catch air through a donut and missing. Now, this is a story all about how... <laughs> It's one of those things where, because I'm usually like pretty open to new ideas, especially new artistic ideas that yeah. haven't been tried before. So it's like, I'm willing to give it a chance. I do think it looks kind of charming in a weird way, because it, there's it's one of those things where, as I saw it, it's like, this is kind of cute. Just a little like graffiti skull and crossbones after fucking up your car. This is kind of adorable. <laughs> the car having wings makes me want to see somebody mod it. Where when a car crashes, you get the cr it starts fly it starts flapping its wings, going up towards the top of the screen, and you just hear the crash bandicoot. Whoa! <laughs> I would be all for that. Copyright strikes be damned. <laughs> Great times. Yeah. That's the only real thing I have. It's kind of a weird thing with that, though, that we're getting leaks because this game is supposed to come out this year. Ah. And there's been, like, no information about it whatsoever. This isn't completely new because when Need for Speed Heat was announced, there was, like, I think a three-month gap between it being announced and it being released. Yep. So, so this isn't completely new, but it is still kind of concerning, especially since... It sounds like it's going to be released possibly in December, and I don't think that's a great time to release, especially a Need for Speed game if you want it to do well. But we'll we'll see what happens there. Yeah, I guess we will. <laughs> Speaking of release dates, we have a Sonic Frontiers release date finally, actually. Good. November 8th. <laughs> okay. No, like, seriously, the fact that that game went for so long without a release date was actually kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Now I guess nothing left to do except see how it pans out. Mm, I mean, I hope it pans out well. Same, I'm getting really sick of being disappointed in Sonic. I mean, you chose to play Sonic 06. Yeah, but that's... <laughs> I'm past that disappointment. <laughs> I'm talking post-generations disappointment. Oh, that's fair. I'm talking Sonic Forces, Sonic Lost World, and Team Sonic Racing disappointment. <sighs> was Team Sonic Racing bad? It's not that it was bad, it's just we we haven't really had much of the way of mainline Sonic games recently, and the fact that one of the more recent ones was just car racing. Car show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little saddening, you know? I can understand that. I do understand that completely. Let's move on to other stuff. Mm-hmm. Halloween Ends has shot itself in the foot. Oh, boy. The best kind of shooting. No, okay, we're going to rescind that. How did it do that? <laughs> it's going theatrical day and date on Peacock, like the movie before. Ugh. Well, have fun not making money. <laughs> yep. To be fair, though, I guess Halloween Kills did do pretty all right anyways, but... I mean, fair. But it's still a case of... Good luck taking away any incentive for people to go see it in the theater. Unless you're like me, and just... Cannot pay attention to something unless it's on a big giant screen in front of you. Fair. It's actually funny. That is actually one of two things that has even like even remotely made me slightly interested in peacock because it's that and whatever the law and order spin-off series was that they brought back chris maloney for oh dear <laughs> yeah i'm not even kidding <laughs> i think that was like at least a year or two ago <laughs> all right 
You want some Beverly Hills Cop news? Why? How long has it been since that's been relevant? Well, they're making a new one for Netflix. Oh, are they now? Yeah, it's now been titled Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley. And Mm -hmm. in addition to Eddie Murphy coming back, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Taylor Page are joining the cast. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, that's all I have to say to it is okay. Because I only watched bits and pieces of it originally, and it was kind of one of those things where... I, it was one of those things where it's like, I can see the demographic that this appeals to, but I cannot get into this at all. <laughs> I have only seen the first one, which means I probably mm. need to catch up on the sequels. But I like the first one very much. That's fair. He he dead ass got away with sticking a banana in their tailpipe. <laughs> I cannot believe that. I did not realize that was an actual thing you could do until I watched that movie. Yeah, it is a thing you could do, and from and if it's, I think they like tested it on MythBusters and everything too. Wow. Yeah, and I believe if I remember correctly, it's not so much a banana, but if you have something that sufficiently like blocks a car's exhaust, banana is just the easiest thing. It will actually fuck up a car real bad. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah, it's produce. <laughs> yeah, and and it's producing a dead engine. I guess. Yes. Eh, I'll, 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 I'm curious about New Beverly Hills Cop. I'm also glad to have this news because it reminds me that I need to make you watch Zola at some point because <laughs> that star Taylor Page. Oh, fair enough. So, yeah. Mm. At some point I'm getting that movie on disc. Yeah, at some point I'm getting, well, there's now three movies I need steelbooks of and I don't want to cross that bridge. <laughs> fair point. We also have some exciting Marvel news. Oh boy. And that is Matt Shackman, the Helmer of WandaVision, is in mm-hmm. talks to direct the Fantastic Four reboot. Oh. Okay, that could be cool. Probably, I, I mean, it's one of those things where it could be cool because WandaVision was very well put together. So I would say he definitely did a good job there. But that is, from what I understand, that is still the only like concrete thing we know about the Fantastic Four reboot, right? Yeah, we still don't have cast or anything. We do know it won't be an origin story, so that's neat. I Mm. wonder if they picked Shackman because the family dynamic in WandaVision worked out very well. Hmm. Because ideally, that's one of the things that sets the Fantastic Four apart from most of the other super teams. Especially because now it feels like a lot of super teams are pushing the whole found family, uh, we're all very close with each other thing. Well, the Fantastic Mm -hmm. Four are direct, known each other most of their lives family. So I feel like being able to play on that is going to be what helps set them apart, along with being scientific explorers rather than just superheroes. So -hmm. the ability to properly capture that family dynamic and make it sympathetic and especially write kids and not have them be awful, is probably (laughs) going to be important. True. I mean, I could see that working out very well, especially since the dynamic, It, I imagine the dynamic would also be much more organic, which would definitely help out a lot too. Yeah. Because we've never really gotten, in a Fantastic Four movie, Franklin and Valeria Richards. Hmm. We've never gotten the kids yet. So that would be a real easy way to set apart from previous iterations. That would be cool. Okay. Especially because Val is a little shit. (laughs) How so? (laughs) She's basically... She's a supervillain in the making. Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) Her future self has apparently grown out of it and is very disappointed with her child self, but she gets along with her Uncle Doom better than she gets along with Reed. That is, I hate to say this, but that just sounds absolutely adorable. It's great. <laughs> it sounds terrifying, but it sounds cute as hell. You know that bit from Loki, Agent of Asgard that I like to quote, where mm. a child asks Doom, can we have ice cream later? And he says, Doom mm. will consider your request. And she just goes, that means yes, I hope we have strawberry. <laughs> yeah. That's her. Oh, that's that girl? Yes, that's Valeria Richards. Oh, no. <laughs> Valeria? 
I'm bad at pronunciation. Valeria, probably. Ooh. That, oh, that is a character I am extremely interested in, then. Another great quote from her, just from the Agent of Asgard run. Uncle Doom only fights invisible people. He doesn't have one for a mom. You know what to look for. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Also, when asked what makes hate easy, she replied, Mommy and Daddy. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) This little girl has zero chill. (laughs) No, she is an utter monster, and she is amazing. That sounds awesome. (laughs) I feel like I'm getting way off topic talking about how great Valeria Richards is. (laughs) Sounds amazing, though. (laughs) So, let's go back to the gift that keeps on giving. Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Is that a gift, though? And is it giving good gifts? No, but it's still a gift that keeps on giving. Hmm. I never said it was a good gift. (laughs) Guess what we forgot to talk about last week? Oh, Flash stuff, didn't we? Yeah, but fortunately there's been new updates as well that help keep it fresh and not just, oh yeah, I forgot to cover this thing last week that I said I would the week before because it Hmm. happened after we recorded. (laughs) Hmm. So Ezra Miller has said they are seeking treatment for complex mental health issues, and in a statement made, they said, Having recently gone through a time of intense crisis, I now understand that I am suffering complex mental health issues and have begun ongoing treatment. I want to apologize to everyone that I have alarmed and upset with my past behavior. I am committed to doing the necessary work to get back to a healthy, safe, and productive stage in my life. And assuming that is true, I wish them all the best with that. Yes, that is that is what I was personally very much hoping for. On the flip side, <laughs> okay. it's a little hard to trust their sincerity at face value because mm-hmm. apparently they were not initially concerned about the bad headlines but started meeting with Warner Brothers after it got out that they were contemplating canceling the movie altogether. Ah, uh, so it's still all about the paycheck ultimately. The implication being yes, if the movie had not been in jeopardy, they would have continued this thing. Mm. Which, hmm. you know, is... <sighs> and it's hard to say, because wake-up calls can come from anywhere. Yeah. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. had a realization about turning his life around after going to Burger King on a bender. <laughs> so, I, uh... <laughs> it's not impossible, you know? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I didn't know about that. The thing I always heard in regards to that was him having an interview about, like, you know, what truly made you want to turn it all around. He said, well, I saw, like, little kids looking at toys of me as Iron Man, and I realized, oh, crap, I'm a role model. Yeah, I can't be doing this. No, I'm talking, I'm talking before Iron Man. Oh, okay. Because you got to remember, they Robert Downey Jr. already turned his shit around before he was Iron Man anyway. Hmm. He didn't become a role model until after Iron Man. He was still, he was on an up before then, but... He had a really bad drug history before the whole Iron Man thing, and apparently what convinced him to turn himself around was getting a bunch of Burger King on a late night bender and realizing that it tasted disgusting to him. It's still so hard to see that. (laughs) Right? That's actually part of why apparently Tony Stark has such a love of cheeseburgers in the movie, as a nod to that. (laughs) Okay. It it's one of those things because I've like read bits and pieces of it, and it's like it's not that I don't believe it. It's just considering my introduction to Robert Downey Jr. was as of Iron Man, yeah, and hearing like all the stuff and like reading all the stuff he's been through. It's like I have just such a hard time seeing it. It's like I believe it, so I guess that just shows how much work he's put into turning his life around. Yeah, no, exactly, because hmm. it's 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 a whole thing. It's a crazy story about turning stuff around. And, like, to that extent, not to make it all about Marvel again, to that extent, I'm not going to write off the apology and the statement to committing to getting well offhand entirely because of that. Mm -hmm. But it is a little difficult to completely take it at face value knowing that. I mean, it's one of those things where I would say both of us very much want the positive result more than anything else for them. But given previous history, it's very hard not to have at least a little bit of skepticism. Oh yeah, I don't want to see anybody suffer as a result of this. Do note, when I say somebody, I mean people and corporations don't count, so I'm perfectly fine with... (laughs) Since presumably everybody who worked on The Flash already got paid anyway, 
Yeah. I don't care if the corporation has to take a $200 million bath on it because it would be problematic to release the movie. Yeah. But I don't know where else I was going with this. <laughs> Fingers crossed for best possible results, I think is kind of the, the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, we're probably going to have to see how the legal proceedings go because I think that's going to be very mm. telling. Yeah, the legal proceedings are going to be a different story considering like all the things um, they've been accused of. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's probably going to be the hard part. So we'll see how that goes. Mm, yeah, I I have a hard time seeing them like having an easier time kind of being like, I'm going to be better about that. Because like, yeah, we get that. But you like broke like several laws. So that's a that's a little bit harder to kind of promise away. So. And it's another one of those things where I don't want to imply that there needs to be any kind of morality clause in acting specifically. Mm -hmm. But I do think if you're representing a superhero... If you're playing a character who, if if they're popular enough, kids are going to be wearing your merchandise with your face on it, or buying mm. toys that are modeled after you, I do feel like in those instances, you, you at least need to not be a huge asshole. Yeah, like, just, just the thing, like... Don't be a criminal, you know? Yeah, it's like, I don't, don't think do it's crimes. <laughs> Don't do crimes. <laughs> At least don't do any major crimes, because, you know, we live in a... This is a bad... There's... <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I'm trying I to do, say, I hope. I do, I do know what you're trying to say. It's like, I don't think you could ask anybody of being clean, because that just kind of goes against human nature at a certain degree. Oh, of course. But it's still a thing of, like, you gotta at least, like, know when to level it off. And ideally, the people who want to hire you should hopefully have the wherewithal to, like, look at your history and go, like, okay, uh, you got a speeding ticket? You ran a stop sign? Okay, big deal. What We all do that, especially all of us millionaires and crap. Um, but, you know, breaking into somebody's house and stealing their booze in the middle of, a, of the woods? Yeah, that's a bit harder to, to kind of ignore. Right. <laughs> but we'll That's see. all. In slightly more positive news for DC, they might have found their new head for overseeing their film and television endeavors. Okay, that's promising. Yes. Dan Lin, who, among other things, produced the live-action Aladdin, mm. the It movies, and the Lego movie. <laughs> okay, that's, that's an encouraging repertoire. Yeah, he's in talks to take on the role of DC chief. Good. Nothing has been locked in yet. Could happen. Mm -hmm. The other issue is that there's still a structural problem. There have been numerous people in charge of DC films, in mm -hmm. a sense. But it doesn't matter who's in charge of DC films when everything still goes through Warner Brothers anyway. Mm. It's not like with Marvel Studios where they were a separate entity before Disney acquired them. And while it's not always the case, Disney generally tends to let them do their own thing. Yeah. Not always the case, because it, it's still a case of, presumably, Disney helps dictate when stuff gets released, because it's like, okay, we can't release this right now because we've got a Star Wars thing going on, and we don't want to take effort away from that. But in terms of yeah. the actual content, generally, they kind of leave well enough alone. Yeah, I mean, it's probably just kind of a general thing where, you know, they leave Marvel alone up until it's the point of like, okay, so we cool? And then Disney's like, okay, yeah, we're cool. Which I imagine is probably the extent of, of that relationship. Yeah, I mean, there are times where Disney steps in and not always for the better, like when they fired James Gunn over Kevin Feige's head. But, hey, they turned <laughs> around on that, so, you know. Uh, lessons learned or something like that. Yeah, so I don't want to imply that this is always a beneficial thing. No. But... Case, But the case still is, Marvel Studios is largely allowed to operate as an independent entity who makes good stuff on their own. And if DC has Warner Brothers breathing down their neck all the time, it doesn't really matter who's in charge. Yeah, because it definitely seems like Warner Brothers is much more hands-on and not in a good way, given recent events. Yeah. Speaking of recent events... Mm-hmm. <laughs> They held funeral screenings of Batgirl on the Warner Brothers lot. F funeral screenings? Yeah. 
basically they're planning on locking all the footage away, and the directors actually already no longer have server access. But they had screenings on the lot for people who worked on the movie and representatives and executives. Oh, that that sucks. It's like, I get the idea, but it also feels like insult to injury. Yeah, that's just kind of like putting salt on the knife and stabbing the person again. <sighs> Yeah, that's 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 very much one of those the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Like, see all the good work you did? It's like you mean the work that'll never see the light of day and that we won't make any more money on, even though we like dedicate our lives to it. But it looks cool, right? <laughs> and from a pragmatic perspective, I can't blame them for not giving the directors access to the footage anymore because if they had done that four years ago, five years ago, sorry, they might have been able mm -hmm. to stop the Snyder Cut from happening. <laughs> but it's still a case of, ugh, dick boom. In this case, I assume because they literally cannot afford to run the risk of the movie getting released, or else no mm -hmm. write-off for them, but it's still a case of, well, you probably shouldn't have done that to begin with. Right. So I can get it, but I don't get it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, for me, I figured it's kind of a security thing more than anything else. It's like, okay, we, you know, it's done, donezo. This is still our IP, so we can't let it get out. I kind of figure that's what the um, the initial thought process was, because that's what would make most sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, but the whole funeral screening thing, that is... That's one of those things where it's like, I can see what they're going for, but... Still kind of tone deaf, guys, just but it's, a little bit. It's hard to say, <laughs> because I feel like for people who worked really hard on that movie, mm -hmm. it's probably at least nice for them to have that closure of being able to see what they were working on, even if it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. And just to be able to look at it and go, that's right, I did help with this. Uh, fair. Oh, well. Hopefully there's some way this can get turned around and we can get that release after all. I doubt it, but... Uh, the power of the internet. Maybe. You we'll say see. that, but... Yeah, as I say, still extremely unlikely, but if there was any way for that movie to go out, it would probably be through means like that. Yeah. And case in point... <laughs> it's hard to say, because on the one hand... I I would say if if Snyder can get his cut of Justice League released, then anything is possible. But there mm -hmm. you run into the problem of in a Variety article outlining all the issues that a potential head of DC Films is going to run into. It is mentioned that privately, studio insiders have lamented that Zack Snyder's Justice League never should have happened <laughs> because what they thought was going to happen was they were going to let him finish the movie, it was going to release, they were going to say, there, you've got closure, and we're not making any more of these, please move on. Instead, the rabid Snyder bros who kept shouting about releasing the Snyder Cut then turned around and are, start and are still campaigning to restore the verse in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And it's like, bruh! Take the L and move on! <laughs> I mean, I I figured that it was going to be things like, yeah, this shouldn't happen just because of the monetary side of things. Yeah, it was a dumb idea from a monetary perspective, too, because yeah. they spent $70 million for something that made them nothing. Yeah, especially since it was. It was ex released exclusively on streaming. Yeah, only HBO yeah. Max, and it didn't even do that great there. No. But all the brain-dead Twitter bots here is, oh, we got it. Let's keep streaming more. Shut up. No, Y'all got yeah. conned by that man. He told you he had a finished cut, ready to go, and all I had to do was be released. And you bought it. It's like, yeah, I got this finished version of this badly received movie. It's like, oh, great, what do we have to do for it? It's like, nothing, nothing, it's gonna be good. Also, I need another $70 million. It's like, but you said it was $70 million. take her to leave it. <laughs> yeah, because he told the... F he, he implied to the fans that a finished cut existed... Warner Brothers went up to him and was like, fine, just let's release what you've got. Oh no, that's not done yet. Yeah, that should have been red flag number one. And hey, the only reason he got away with it is because he took a laptop with him with a with the rough four-hour cut lying around when he left the movie in the first place. 
That whole situation is fucked. Hollywood's weird. It is. <laughs> Makes me very upset. Understandably so. We also got some date changes from Warner Brothers. Oh boy. Yeah, we got good news for Shazam. It's no longer going up against Avatar 2. Good. Holy crap. I was gonna... That was the one where it's like, okay, no, y'all gotta... Someone has to actually think for a second. Like, y'all gotta blink not... on that one. Yeah, for real. Instead, it's moving to March 17th, 2023, which was originally the release date for Aquaman 2. Well, how does that work out? <laughs> well, Aquaman 2 has been pushed all the way back to December 25th, 2023. Christmas. I I almost don't believe this movie exists. <laughs> I still do not understand the concept of seeing a movie, not only seeing a movie on Christmas, but seeing a movie that releases on Christmas. That still just makes zero sense to me. I mean, the Christmas release is probably just because, wait, is that a Thursday? Or a Friday, rather? If it's a Friday, then it makes sense, because that just happens to be the date. Hmm. One sec. I'm checking. I'm checking. Okay. No, it's a Monday. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe other thing is like, hey, it's the end of the Christmas weekend. Everyone's like still got a day off from work at school. Hey, how about you go to the movies, guys? What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> I mean, I'll occasionally go to the movies on Christmas. I mean, ugh. I don't know. It's one of those things that doesn't make sense to me, but it especially doesn't make it doubly doesn't make sense in this case with Christmas being on a Monday. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I don't know. I still don't know if I'm going to see any DC movie at this point other than Shazam. Yeah, Shaz I mean, I'm still probably going to see Black Adam. Oh, Shazam right. Is, but Shazam is definitely the one I have the most interest in. Plus, it's either Black Adam or it was something terrible. Mm. <laughs> it's like, it's not even a name, just something terrible. I don't remember what it was. Hold on, I have to figure <laughs> it out. God, I can't believe this. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> we all say looking at Warner Brothers. Oh, it was either that or Ticket to Paradise. Oh, that's the one where it's the couple, like, arguing about their daughter's fiancé, right? Yeah, it's George Clooney and Julia Roberts, and you can already see where the whole movie is going just from the trailer, and none of it's funny. Yeah, Black Adam wins. I'd rather watch Black <laughs> Adam than that, I'll admit. <laughs> just sliding into your DMs like this really bad romance movie. Some other changes that Warner Brothers has made to their release schedule is... Salem's Lot has been removed from its April 21st, 2023 date, and no new date has been announced. Mm. In its place on that date, we're getting Evil Dead Rise. Okay. We're getting The Nun 2 for September 8th, 2023. Mm-hmm. And we're getting, and I did not know this was happening, a remake of House Party by New Line for December 9th, 2022. I'm not familiar with that one. It was a movie starring Kid and Play. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay, sure. Why not? I don't think this one is, though. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would hope so. But still, the, the question, the thing at that point is, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> For more Warner Brothers stuff, Matt Reeves has signed a multi-year first look deal with Warner Brothers. Okay. So that's neat. Hmm. Basically, Warner Brothers and its production divisions will have first look rights to Reeves' work as a writer, director, or producer. Okay. So, more or less, yeah, so it's an exclusivity contract, more or less. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Or at least it's pretty much, we've got first dibs on a thing you're working on if we want to do it or not. Presumably he can take it elsewhere if they don't, but... Oh, okay. It's kind of like the Universal Hulk thing. Hmm. Where Disney can make a Hulk movie, Universal just has first dibs on saying whether they want to distribute it or not. Okay. Oh, I mean, that's kind of one of those things where it's like, that sounds neat. Curious to see what comes of it from there. Yeah, and they're going to need it, because now that the end of their deal with Legendary Entertainment is coming up, mm -hmm. it is being said that Legendary is looking to move elsewhere. Oh. Oh, that's not good, is it? Yeah. You want to know something mm. even worse? Hmm. The frontrunner for who they want to work with instead 
is Zack Snyder. Is Sony. <laughs> All right. Somehow I feel like that's a little bit worse. <laughs> yeah. For reference, okay. Legendary Entertainment are the ones who made Detective Pikachu. They're the ones making the MonsterVerse with Godzilla and Kong. They made Dune. Mm. Warner Brothers just distributed those. Okay. So if Legendary leaves, that's some good potential right down the drain. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of talent like just gone right there. And you know you fucked up when they'd rather work with Sony. Yeah, that's <laughs> But that's to be expected, considering Warner Brothers did that stupid... First, they did that stupid day and date with HBO Max for everything coming out in 2021, which absolutely crippled the box office for a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. And while it didn't cut the kneecaps off of Godzilla vs. Kong, you gotta imagine they were not happy with that. Yeah. Especially because they thing. weren't consulted with beforehand, either. Oh, really? No. Oh, Warner Brothers dude. made that decision without talking with any of their production companies. Dude. Yeah. That's rude as hell. <laughs> 100%. And now that they've done all these tax write-offs, mm -hmm. it's no wonder other companies are like, yeah, we don't think we want to work with these guys since anything we are doing could just get unceremoniously cut. Yeah, that's... Jesus, man. Apparently Warner Brothers has lost... Twenty billion dollars in market capital. Oh, gee, I wonder why. To save three billion dollars. That's some good math. Yeah, I mean, that's it's it's math, all right. I don't know about good, but it's math. That's for damn sure. <laughs> Indeed, it technically is. Hmm. Let's move on to trailer time. Trailer time. Let's start with the one theatrical movie on this list. <laughs> <laughs> which is sa which is actually amazing. <laughs> I I don't understand. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> I don't know what happened to all the theatrical trailers this week. Mm. Anyways, it's A twenty four's The Inspection. So this is definitely a me movie. Yeah, that's a hundred percent for sure. This is very much a me movie. It's one of those weird things where I am definitely very interested in it, but I can't exactly tell you why. Because it just looks like a generally heart rending story. Yeah, I did read the premise of the movie because it's apparently based on actual events. It takes place before Don't Ask, Don't Tell is taken away. Ah. And what it basically is is that there's this, it's like the main character is a guy who wants to enter the Marine Corps, but he's gay. And it sounds and, like his mom doesn't like him much. No, yeah, it's basically like he's a gay, a gay black dude in the Marine Corps during a time when the, mili the U.S. military really doesn't like gay people. And he's just trying to make some kind of life for himself, but he's trying to also hide this part of him. And from what I can tell, it it doesn't exactly work out, and it doesn't go well for him more than likely because this is, I think it was like post, it was the last time I repealed. It doesn't fucking matter. Um, I am definitely very interested in this, but odds are not are not great for our main character here. That's for sure. Yeah. This is another one of those ones where, to me at least, it doesn't necessarily scream A24. Yeah, that was... It doesn't well, that, It doesn't look bad. It certainly looks good. No, no it's kind of weird when I... Because my first thought was, granted, it could have been that they just did one before and I didn't catch it. But when it was shown that he was entering the Marine, as soon as they ran off the bus and I was getting yelled at, and they were getting yelled at by the drill sergeant, like, this is a Marine Corps movie. Since when does A24 do military movies? I mean, they could do whatever they want. And yeah. who knows, because apparently Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is really good, despite also not really feeling to me like one of those, like an A24 movie from the trailers. Yeah. And I'm kind of sad that I didn't see it, and now I'm going to have to watch it at some point. Yeah, it was kind of one of those things where, and I hate to say this because it's one of those things where I can't think of a good way to say it without sounding like a dick. But it was a thing of like when I read the premise and saw that it's about this Marine who's trying to make it through the Marine Corps without letting out that he's gay. It was a thing of like, OK, I can think I can kind of see the A24 gears turning here. Yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah. I mean, I think it looks I think it looks interesting. I'm definitely like 
I'm definitely very interested in it, that's for sure. Same. It comes out November 18th, so... Oh, hey, there we go, not too far away. Yeah, I've been bad about catching A24 movies this year so far. I missed yeah. Marcel, the show where she was on, I missed Bodies, 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 I didn't see everything everywhere all at once until very late in the run. Yeah. I did see Men, yeah. though. I liked Men. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I hate my brain. For I'm what secure. Just... <laughs> no, as you should be. I just, I'm just saying I hate my brain so much right now. Fair. <laughs> and I am also very secure, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I mean, I've also been pretty bad about seeing A24 stuff as well. Um, Probably so going to have to fix like... that with this one. Oh, yeah. Is yeah, there... 100%. Shit, wait. Is there anything else releasing that same weekend? Let me check. I hope not. And if I if there is, I hope it's something that I can reasonably expect to skip mm -hmm. and see this instead. Please tell me Wakanda Forever is in that same. <laughs> that would be something. Nope. Week before. Cool. Good. Good. Thank goodness. Oh, this is limited release and so is the menu. Oh, really? Ooh. Oh. Double feature? We'll find Probably. out. We'll see we'll when we get to it. Yeah, we'll cross that bridge. Yeah, like we do most things. <laughs> we finally got an actual look at Pinocchio in motion for the Disney Plus live-action remake. And it does not look good. It could be better. Yeah, it was... For me, it was one of those things where it's like, this is a very good and very faithful recreation of Pinocchio. It just, for me, felt very jarring in the live-action setting. Is it weird that I would have liked it better if they had just operated him as a puppet and digitally removed the strings. The strings. I would have been very curious to see that. I think I would have been okay with that more than what they're going for now. I wonder if it's an Uncanny Valley thing. Probably. I mean, it it, it has to be in some extent, considering how much they were teasing the, the movie and how it's only now, because they've been basically teasing this and showing trailers for this for, I want to say like a year at this point. No, we only got the teaser trailer a few months ago. We talked about it on the podcast. Oh, that's true. I feel like for whatever reason, it's been longer than that. But it feels like it's just been a ridiculously long time between showing the movie, like being that's like, hey, this is coming, and us actually seeing what the titular character looks like. I don't know. It's it's just a weird thing for me because like it doesn't look. I can't say it looks bad objectively because it doesn't. Just something about it just does not sit right with me at all. Maybe it feels like the marketing for this movie's been going on longer because there's also another Pinocchio movie coming out this year. There is? Yeah, it's the one for Netflix, directed by Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> okay. That probably... Yeah, you know what? That that doesn't help. And does Ewan McGregor help. is Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> okay. I am significantly more interested in that. Yeah. And I say that and I say that as a big fan of Tom Hanks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know cuz the the Pinocchio stuff doesn't look bad. It just doesn't click for me. Yeah, no. And I I genuinely wonder if it's because maybe it's too well done as a puppet where it's like if it was a little more artificial I might buy it. And that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> I guess it's consistent with my it would be better if it were worse. It was a, a thought that popped in my head while I was watching it. And I think it's because of the fact that Pinocchio in this is so reminiscent of the original 2D character. That at a certain point, especially when he's like dancing in the street with the sun and just like looking with wide eyes at Tom Hanks. I couldn't help but think to myself, Pinocchio really looks like Mega Man right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> And I, I don't know where that came from. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about my favorite trailer for this week. Mm -hmm. Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Oh, I completely missed this one. Oh, that's a shame because let me tell you, it is now readily apparent that this is a parody movie. Oh, really? Yes, it is I so... Over the top now. 
<laughs> well, it, to be fair, to be fair, when it was announced that Daniel Radcliffe was playing Weird Al, it's like, okay, writers, what you got in store? <laughs> yeah, no, but you know how the trailer, the first trailer we got, didn't really feel like a parody. It just felt mm. like another biopic movie. Yeah. But with Daniel, like, the only part to me that felt super exaggerated was the, I need an accordion, and then three people from off camera hand him an accordion. <laughs> that was the closest thing to an actual like parody moment but this whole thing the the trailer literally ends with somebody telling him he can't smoke in the it was like an executive telling him he can't smoke in the office or something and <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe proceeds to put out the cigarette on the guy's wrist just oh. staring at him and then the guy goes <laughs> you know what I deserve that <laughs> I'm like oh this is just it's uh. like no no you don't? There's a dot, whole dot, dot. subplot apparently about him getting into drugs and like getting into fights with the band because he's dating Madonna. Hmm. <laughs> so is this Weird Al's equivalent of unbearable weight of massive talent? I guess. Because that's what that sounds like. It's basically, yeah, because it's basically Weird Al making a movie or a movie being made. Which tries to present Weird Al's rise to fame like it's some big, grandiose, epic tale when it wasn't. Mm. Granted, it's it's an impressive rise considering what he does, but they paint it like yeah. his parents don't support him, which wasn't the case in real life. But they're cartoonishly not cool about it. <laughs> they're having a dinner table conversation and they say, we've decided what would be best is if you just don't be yourself. <laughs> and then him getting in trouble because I, I think it was a police officer brought him home and said we found your son at a polka party okay yeah that's some like the that's whole some thing is so over the top it's great I can't wait it's coming to the Roku channel November 4th I think and mm -hmm. Greg and I not you but other Greg have already decided we need to watch it together at the same time it comes out I would like to be a part of that if possible. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, definitely check it out when you get the chance. It's it's my favorite trailer this week. And it just <laughs> okay. dropped today. Okay. Shall we move on to Prime Video's Goodnight Mommy? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I have n I have no idea how to react to that trailer, in like in all honesty. I mean it's definitely horror. It's full on horror, but it's it's kind of one of those weird things where it's like, I both understand the premise and am deeply confused by what I'm watching at all at the same time. Well, apparently it's a remake of an Austrian film from 2014. Hmm. And that's all about all I know because I refuse to look anything up about this movie because I might actually watch it. I'm curious about it. Oh, it comes else. out September sure. 16th. That's right. So this will be full blown spooky season for me. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to hold off on watching horror movies until October, and then I realized that was a dumb idea. <laughs> I do wonder if it's... Because they're definitely presenting it as, that's not the mom. Yeah, no, it's... Like, that was kind of the thing, too, especially when they're comparing, like, the photos of her... And of, like, their mother and of the woman behind the bandages. It's like, okay, I, I think I see what we're, what's going on here now. But the thing is, do we? Because mm. it could also be... I, I never know what to trust with horror movies anymore with trailers, because it could be they're taking us for a ride, and maybe the kids are crazy. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, that would definitely be an interesting twist. That's not... You know, like, the kids losing their minds is not something that really pops up that often. Honestly, the main thing, besides comparing the pictures, is her saying, you, you'll you learn to love me, is the thing that makes me think mm -hmm. it is an imposter thing. Yeah. It's like, you are not the real mother. <laughs> but then what is she? Well, not the I'm real curious. mother. I'm curious. I'm very curious. <laughs> I'm excited to see this. Mm. I'm excited to see this and then watch the original so I can so I can complain about the differences. Okay. I'm kidding. Yeah. But I'll still probably try to watch the original afterward if I can find it. Right, right. And I guess that just leaves Netflix's White Noise. This is a movie I'm very interested in, 
but it's also kind of one of those things where I feel like especially like finding out what the premise of the book is, is that I feel like I need to read the book before I see this movie. <laughs> mm. I just know it's a satirical novel, apparently. It's a very satirical novel. Um, I don't know all the, the bits of it. So apparently one of the main things to kind of give, I guess, a little bit of, of it away, but it's kind of covered in the basic premise of the novel too. Mm. Adam Driver's character, um, he plays a college professor whose whole class and whatnot is teaching students about adolf hitler okay and what happens in this at least in the book from what i understand and i could be completely wrong if i am completely wrong please call me out on it is that part of it also covers like he has like a bit of a crisis about the fact that he teaches people about hitler but he doesn't he's never been to germany he doesn't understand german all this other stuff um, along with that, and he feels like he's got a bad imposter syndrome going. And that by itself is enough to make me go, okay, this sounds completely batshit. I need to read this. And it's like, oh, Adam Driver's doing this? Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it looks cool. It's one of those things where it looks cool without also giving away too much about the movie itself, which... God almighty, more trailers need to be better about that. I feel like you could stand and tell me a little bit more, because I did not get anything from this trailer. Well, no, I I mean, so that that bit I found out just by looking it up after seeing the, the um, trailer, because it is a thing of, after I finished watching, it's like, okay, what is this exactly? And then I found out about more about the book. For me, kind of the interesting points of the trailer are just Adam Driver's like monologue during the whole thing. And also them saying, it's like, they don't look scared, but they look pretty scared. It's like, okay, what the hell's going on? And then just the family having their eyes glued to whatever's happening in front of them. This seems very all over the place. And normally when it comes to things that are just completely jumping all over the place, they kind of lose me pretty quickly. Yeah. But in this case, it's one of the... I mean, I'm probably also biased because I do enjoy Adam Driver a lot. And it's been a while since I've seen something that he's been in. Right. But I don't know. It looks interesting. And honestly, finding out about the novel just made me even more interested as well, in all honesty. Yeah. I guess we'll see. Apparently, there's no set release date for when it hits Netflix beyond this year. Mm. I did get excited because it said the release date was August 31st, which would be two days from now. But apparently, that's only when it's debuting at a film festival. Yeah, in Venice. Apparently there's a, um, it's releasing in September for the New York Film Festival. Yeah. So, probably, like, if I had to guess, maybe November. Maybe. We'll see. So before we get into the movies today, let's cover this weekend's box office real quick. da da da, da It's da, been da, another da. slow weekend. Not a surprise there. <laughs> Not at all. Hmm. First place, The Invitation. Okay. 6.8 million domestically this weekend and in total, 8.4 million dollars worldwide. Second place, Bullet Train at 5.6 million domestically for a 78.2 million dollar domestic total and 173.6 million dollars worldwide. Third place is Beast at 4.8 million dollars domestically for a 20 million dollar domestic total and 36.1 million dollars worldwide. Fourth place, it's your favorite movie that you're sick of seeing on this list, Top Gun Maverick. $4.7 million <laughs> domestically for a $691.1 million domestic total and $1.42 billion worldwide. And mm. in fifth place, Dragon Ball Super Superhero, which I also saw and enjoyed this week, at $4.6 million domestically for a $30.8 million domestic total and $68.7 million worldwide. Didn't 3,000 Years of Longing come out this weekend, too? It did. It did not make the top five. Holy shit. I think it landed on <laughs> seven. Whoa. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's not a good sign. <laughs> no, it's not. You want to talk about that one first, then, and uh, tell me if that's a bad thing that it didn't place. I mean, it's if you want to. Yeah, might as well. Go ahead. Okay, so we're just moving straight into that part? Yeah, let's just talk about 3,000 Years of Longing. We're doing a double feature this week, because Greg and I saw completely different movies. Yes, so... To kind of, I guess, give a basic outline of the movie, 3,000 Years of Longing is apparently a dark comedy, or dark fantasy, sorry, which does track considering like how this movie goes, 
the mo- the basic premise is that it primarily stars Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba. Tilda Swinton is someone she's part of a group that basically like studies stories throughout history and reads them and learns more about them to make presentations for. And then during a trip in Istanbul, she comes across a glass bottle and it's, you know, kind of the whole thing of rubs the bottle. Chug, chug, pops, chug, 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 chug. And out pops Idris Elba as the djinn, which is the actual original name of genie. Genie is like an anglicized version of that word. Yep. And more or less from there, it's just kind of the two of them interacting with each other and hearing the stories of the djinn and his time through history. This is... This is a movie. (laughs) In what way? So, So, this is a movie that's actually, for me, a little frustrating. Because Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba are both phenomenal. Their dynamic is great. They're very fun to, like, watch and listen to during the whole movie. But the problem more so is that the first half of the movie is a hell of a lot better than the second half. Because the second half kind of comes out of nowhere and has no, like, I have so much little attachment to it. And it's really hard for me not to get into that without talking about spoilers. So are we just going to do, like, spoilers right away for this? Uh, I mean, if you don't have anything else to say that isn't covered by spoilers. The only other thing I could say about this movie is that this is a very COVID movie. <laughs> okay. I mean, besides, you know, there's characters who are wearing masks inside airports and whatnot, but half of the movie literally takes place inside of an apartment. Ah, I see. So there's just the two of them talking in an apartment. It's like, okay, this is, yeah, this is a COVID movie in a weird way. Would you recommend this movie to our fine listeners? (sighs) I would say this movie is worth seeing. But don't be shocked if you leave not liking it. Fair. Because it is kind of a thing where I could completely see why someone doesn't like it. I think it's kind of neat overall, but there are definitely a couple times where it's kind of hard to keep track in a couple spaces. There is one particular major moment where just, like I said, it just kind of goes off the rails and feels completely unorganic, and that's where it lost me a lot. I will say, given some of the places that this movie covers in terms of subjects and characters and whatnot, in my brain, I I said, this is your humanities professor's favorite movie. (laughs) (laughs) All right, that really helps put a cap on it. (laughs) I do actually have something to point out having not seen the movie and that's that this was directed by george miller it is it was directed by george miller i forgot to mention that apparently it's based on a uh, 90s british series of short stories i think were called the Jin and the nightingale or something along those lines from what i understand because i've never read the story But from what I've seen, apparently the movie, arguably to its detriment, is actually an extremely faithful retelling of that story. Okay. So, but with that as well, that uh, that apparently explains why things happen the way they happen. Well, I also wanted to bring up George Miller just to to point out that, uh, for those who aren't in the know, he is the director of all the Mad Max movies, Mm -hmm. both Happy Feet movies. (laughs) <laughs> the Twilight Zone movie. Right. And Babe, Pig in the City. Did you know, I actually, I, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because I was like looking him up um, when I was trying to find more information about the movie. Between 1979, when he had his first director role for the first Mad Max, and now, he's only directed 14 movies. That is pretty nuts. I mean, this is his first movie in seven years. Yeah, it's really crazy because from what i've gathered he is a very well respected and very talented director so it's nuts to me that he has directed so few movies in like 30 odd years of of directing well originally he was going to direct a justice league movie oh really back in 2007 that would have been very cool to see (laughs) yeah shame we didn't get that could have completely changed the trajectory of everything but anyways (laughs) <laughs> Enough talking about other stuff George Miller has done. Let's get mm. into the real meat and potatoes of this movie, 3,000 Years of Longing. So if you don't want to be spoiled, stop listening, 
in three, two, one. And don't worry, you can always jump ahead to the invitation because I'll be making timestamps. Yes. Spoil this shit uh, for me. <laughs> um. So the basic. So what more or less happens with it being a story of the genie and whatnot is that you have to is that. Tilda's witness tasked with making three wishes. During the first half of the movie, like I said, the djinn, and he is just referred to as the djinn, which actually bugged the shit out of me. It's like, I don't know if he originally had a name in the in like the stories about him. Nah. But it was one of those things, okay, because it was one of those things like, he has to have a name, right? Nope. Um, okay, but it was telling, he's telling the stories of the three times he got incarcerated. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's phrasing. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. He's incarcerated so in this fucking bottle. He was incarcerated... <laughs> he was incarcerated by King Solomon. Um, that tracks. He was, he was pseudo-incarcerated by the death of Mustafar. And he was finally... And actually from that, he was... When he got himself out, he was discovered by one of Mustafar's brother's concubines, and he goes nuts saying, please, please, you have to help me. Just make one more wish. I need you to make a wish so I like can get free from this curse. And the concubine, being very scared and confused, goes, I wish you would go back into your bottle at the bottom of the sea. Reset! <laughs> Are you sure it's yeah, that... Mustafar? I, prob- I think so. I'm probably getting it. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. Okay. Yeah. Because I am historically uh, ignorant, but I can't help but think you're talking about the Star Wars planet. No. <laughs> I might be, actually, by accident. Um, and then kind of goes... O- and then the last story goes over the time when he met a young Turkish girl and granted her free wishes and the story of how he fell in love with her. Now, with this story in particular, before all of this, Tilda Swinton is understandably very suspicious about a genie just appearing in her apartment and being like, you know, how do I know you're actually trying to help? How do I know you're not like a trickster gin or anything like that? And then after he finishes telling the last story, she goes, I think I know what my wish is. And it's like, okay, what is it? I'm here because I'm supposed to be in love with you. It's like, what? <laughs> okay. And then it goes into a whole thing of, like, I wish for the two of us to be madly in love. And then starts the second half of the movie where um, they fall in love, they start a relationship, they go back to London where she lives, and it turns into this weird-ass slice-of-life thing. Um, Okay, now I gotta see this movie. What the hell? Yeah, it's... I didn't like this portion. Because it also there's a bit where she has like a, a a verbal fight with two bigoted neighbors of hers, which just completely comes out of nowhere. <laughs> it's just like they start going on about how like we Britons need to like keep our like just keep our natural order of things. I'm like, where the fuck is this coming from? Oh, dear. <laughs> Brexit stage left. For real, <laughs> like it was kind of a thing. Like, is this a Brexit commentary? I am deeply deeply confused by this and the relevance of this but no because the first half of the movie which is just the two of them telling stories of their own experiences was just so much more interesting it ha- the production quality of it was great all like the twists and turns and whatnot are just really really fun and really sad and then it just goes to my life with the genie and it kind of falls apart pretty hard at the end you know i was Um, about to say that should be a sitcom and then i realized they already (laughs) fucking made it in like the 60s i think they did yeah (laughs) oh god um also apparently one of the things that's mentioned in the movie like that's shown very explicitly in the first 20 minutes and never is like like circled back around to is that Tilda Swinton's character apparently has very severe hallucinations of demonic characters from the stories that she's read. One of which is a character that actually shows up in like the Jin's retelling of his time with Shiva and King Solomon. You betrayed Shiva. (laughs) And it's a weird thing of like, 
Because what happens with that is that one of the demons is actually in the presentation that she that she's doing, and he's getting closer and closer and closer to her in the audience. And she more or less says something to the effect of, you are not real while giving the presentation. And he immediately, like, freaks out, attacks her. But when we come back to her, it shows that she's, like, fainted in the middle of the presentation. And we never circle back around to that. It's like, okay, is this related at all to her coming across the djinn? Does this have... No, this was just straight up a hallucination. That kind of sucks. Because I was thinking it was going to be some kind of thing where these are actual like spirits that are attacking her and she has to, as cliche as this is, team up with Idris Elba as the djinn to fight off against the evil spirits. And it's like, that would have been much more interesting in the second half than what we ended up getting. Um, yeah, it's... Like I said, it's a it's a weird movie. It's it's one of the it's a weird movie where it's really neat. The places it covers it's really neat. The stories it covers it's really neat. The production quality is there, and like I said, Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton do a great job. But the second half of the movie just lost a lot of points with me pretty hard, and that's why I say it's one of those films where it's worth at least seeing in theaters once, but. Don't be surprised if you leave this, the theater disliking it. I am probably going to have to see this this week, then. Yeah, it's... I I would I would say this is a you movie. <laughs> Me! Yeah, I would say this is a movie that, if nothing else, you can have a lot of fun with. And probably not the best possible way, but still have a lot of fun with. <laughs> Alright, we good then? Yeah, yeah, I'm finished with that. That's all I have to say about 3,000 Years of Longing. Which All right. is apparently bombing really hard in the theaters. <laughs> That's sad from the sound yeah. of it. Mm. I don't want to see that happen. <laughs> no. Well, actually, now I'm curious. What's the Spoofy's budget? That was what I was trying to find. Hold on. $60 million. Oh, no! <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's... All right. That's well... tragic. That is very tragic. Well, I hope Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba got their pay ahead of time, because holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alright. Cool. Alright, let me tell you about the, the vampire movie that's trying really hard to convince you it's not a vampire movie. <laughs> and that's The Invitation. The Invitation, which very much was one of those things where, based on the trailers and all, it was like, you know what? I don't think I need to see this movie. I very much got the feeling that this was one of those movies where it's going to have at least one or two moments where it's like, I could have gone my entire life without seeing it. So, I'm glad that you saw it for me. <laughs> There's... Uh, I didn't hate it. Mm. Which, admittedly... I am not a good judge of horror movies, mm -hmm. because when it comes to horror movies, I am very easy to please. Because mm. the thing about horror movies is, when they're good, they're really good. Mm -hmm. And they do their job right, and you're terrified of whatever it is the movie's trying to make you be terrified of. <laughs> but when they're bad, they're generally at least funny. Yeah, as I say, usually the bad horror movies you can have fun with along the way. Bad horror makes for great comedy. Yeah. Which is something that almost any other movie genre cannot say the same of. Mm -hmm. It's Horror just has this unique thing where even at its worst, you can generally find something to like about it. I mean, admittedly, there's also that in other genres, like, usually the acting at least can be decent, but there's just, right. there's something about specifically a scary movie failing to be scary that you can still salvage it and get a fun <laughs> time out of. Thinks back to the antifreeze scene in Jack Frost. Right? That movie is terrible. <laughs> and yet... I get so much joy out of Jack Frost. <laughs> is it, how much of that is caused by me getting mad at that one particular scene? 30%. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So, <laughs> after seeing this movie, when I saw the reviews, I thought, especially the Rotten Tomatoes score, I thought, that's kind of low. But then I thought about it, and I realized, no, actually, that's about accurate. <laughs> this movie is not good. Mostly because it is painfully slow. How slow are we talking? Well, to give you an idea of the the rundown, so to speak, mm -hmm. our main character, Evie, who is played by Natalie Emanuel, is an artist in New York City who isn't really making it work as an artist, so she's doing, you know, all kinds of smaller work, functionally. Mm -hmm. And she decides in the wake of her mom recently passing away, to submit a DNA kit to find out if she's got any other family. Turns mm -hmm. out she does. She meets her second cousin, and he invites her to come to England for a family wedding. And she decides, you know what, I got nothing else going on right now, I'll go ahead and do that. And while she's there for the wedding, she starts falling for the lord of the manor that they're staying at, Walter DeVille, played by Thomas Doherty. Okay, I'm sorry, if your last name is DeVille, then you're already a villain. Oh, right! <laughs> <laughs> like, damn. Right! It's little <laughs> things like that. And I'll get into it a bit more, probably in the spoiler section, when I get a little more detailed. Mm hmm But, it turns out almost not as it seems. Ancient packs and what have you, and a lot of dead help. <laughs> dead help. <laughs> but... It takes so long for the horror elements to really get in a full swing. There's a couple of moments where they do scares. There's a couple of deaths throughout the earlier parts of the movie. But it's not until probably the last half an hour that things really get in a swing. Mm -hmm. And it's just ponderous other than that. And it would be one thing if, if it didn't have any horror elements at all at that early part. Or at least, if they kept it all ambiguous. But, mm -hmm. there's enough stuff where they show people dying, and it's not from the main character's perspective, so you know it's being presented as fact. So mm -hmm. there's no ambiguity to it. It's, something bad is going on, stick around to find out exactly <sighs> what. And it's like, well, it's obviously vampires. Yeah. Yeah, but no, but hold on, it's vampires. <laughs> No, but seriously, I think you're gonna... It's, it's fucking vampires. Come on. I'm not saying it's vampires, but it's fucking vampires. Even if I couldn't <laughs> guess it was vampires from the bits in it, and even if it wasn't for some naming conventions, which I'll get into, mm -hmm. you gave this shit away in the trailers, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Come on, you're not fooling me. And when it finally does get started, there's not enough time to actually let the real horrifyingness of the situation sink in. Mm. But I will give props to the cast. They were enjoyable. Especially Thomas Doherty, who does a really good job at being superficially charming, but behind his eyes you can tell everybody is a medium rare steak. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at everyone, it was like, mm, we got some good eatings tonight. <laughs> I saw a weird comparison when I was browsing through r slash movies afterward that I can't help but agree with. The movie gives me weird ready or not vibes. But I'll add, without the humor. From some of the, like, from a couple of things I read about people talking about the movie, that was kind of the vibe I got. It's like, this sounds like a less fun version of ready or not. Yeah, it's more romance drama oriented ready or not, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work. It does not work that way. Mm -hmm. So, it's hard to talk about this one without spoiling it, specifically because the movie doesn't get into gear until there's 30 minutes left in this hour, 40 minute movie. Oh, woof. Yeah. Oof. Which, so I probably already spoiled some stuff just by saying there's vampires in it, which, I don't know, I, I feel like that's not a spoiler, but maybe it is. So I'm just gonna say, you know what? It may, big spoilers from here on out. Three, mm -hmm. two, one. D don't bother going to see this movie. It's <laughs> I if you like horror movies and you just want to go sit through a horror movie, I guess it's fine. But otherwise, don't. And I say that as somebody who had a decent enough time with it, but it's not 
It's not good. Mm. It's really not good. So anyways, the weirdest thing for me about this movie is it's kind of a Dracula adaptation. Oh, is it now? Yeah, or at least it's inspired by Dracula, and you can tell by some of the naming conventions, like... The manor they're staying at is New Carfax Abbey, and Carfax <laughs> Abbey is the place that Dracula was leasing in England. Mm. So that's a that's a little thing. Uh, his butler's name is Mister Field, so like Mister Renfield, mm. the his Tony in the original. But there's also bits where they have references, and there's no reason for it. Hmm. Case in point, there's a bit where, after finding out the truth of everything, she actually manages to escape the castle, and she gets into town, and she's asking people for help, and she quickly realizes that they're in league with the vampires, but they end up knocking her out and bringing her back anyway. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing is, right before we find that out, and she finds that out, they introduce themselves as Mina Harker and Jonathan Harker. Oh, come on. And it's like, who the <laughs> fuck is that for? Yeah, uh, it, dude. It would be one thing if there was an extended sequence of them helping her, and then you pull the rug out. Because mm -hmm. anybody who's made the connection of Carfax, Abby, and Mr. Field, and there's probably some other ones that I'm missing, but, you know. If, if you want to do it to be subversive, then you need time for that subversion to build. It doesn't do any good to go, oh, here are the Harkers, because by the time you've caught up to, oh, like in Dracula, they've already pulled the rug out, and it turns out they're bad people, and it's like, well, that's, that's weird. Hmm. Huh. That and there's some, is... there's some weird visual symbolism, too, that ended up not really going anywhere. The DNA kit company that she uses, their symbol is a key with, three holes on top of it, I guess, for lack of a better mm -hmm. lack of a better is it, thing. Is it like the three holes, or but they're like kind of like in the form of a cross? Uh, I wouldn't say in a cross, more like a, yeah, I get it forms a cross with the, with the key itself. So okay. like, uh, there's hmm. a there's a circle on the left, a circle on the right, a circle on top. It's a pyramid of circles. Yeah. I think I know what symbol that is. I can't remember the name of it. I wouldn't even call it a kind of... symbol, it's just three circles. Yeah, but it's still one of those things where it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's definitely another hint there. And there was a similar looking key that's used to unlock the, the library, which is where, I guess... It's not even... It's weird, because they tell her don't go into that room, but the only reason not to go into that room is because, I guess, he's in there when he's a vampire, but even then, he doesn't do... He only does one kill in the library, and the other two happen in the cellar. Hmm. So it's not even like he's exclusively hiding out in the library when he's in vampire mode, because that's not the case. <laughs> so I don't know what that was about. But the key looked very similar, and there's also a similar pattern on the carpet where they're having their outdoor dance party at one point, only this one is four circles in a square. Mm-hmm. And I was expecting that to come up and have it be, oh, they were somehow responsible for the DNA kit, which would have been ludicrous. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking now. It's like, okay, so what? These guys are part of the company that did the DNA test? No! As far as I know, it never comes up. Oh. What? Not related. That's... It's one of the. It's like, yes, you're correct in that it would be completely ludicrous, but it sounds like the movie was setting up for that. It, yeah! It's one of those things where... No, this was a dumb idea, but then why did you hint at it? So <laughs> so we would go, oh, congratulations on not doing that stupid thing. I guess. Right. And I was expecting, especially because everybody else at the party is frightfully white. <laughs> and the lead actress is not. Yes. So I was expecting the whole thing to be a scam. Mm -hmm. And that they just needed her for whatever, I don't know. Especially once it turns out that he was looking into her when the results came in before he invited her over, and uh, turns out, what it actually is, is he has three brides, one from each family, and those three bloodlines 
when married to him, give them all power. But they've been missing one because the main character's great-grandmother, I think it was the great-grandmother, ended up killing herself, and as far as they knew, there was no family until they found her. Okay. So... Yeah, I was expecting a big setup of surprise. Of course you're not really... But nope, they are. That's convenient. And apparently it's supposed to make them all very powerful, but it's never really stated what that means, and they seem to have been getting along just fine without a member of her bloodline anyway. Yeah. So I don't know what they mean by that. And then at the end of the movie, she ends up agreeing to the ceremony and drinking his blood, and apparently, I, I think it was supposed to be they were supposed to exchange blood with each other, but she drinks his blood, turns into a vampire, proceeds to start fucking all their shit up. <laughs> okay. And then... She loses the powers once the vampire dies. And I just mm. don't... I understand that part, I guess, but it's a case of why didn't... I don't... I don't know how this works. I don't understand why this ritual is the way it is, because it's not broken down well, because they left it all for the last 30 fucking minutes of the movie. I figured it'd be a thing of, like, once the once the person that she took the blood from dies, she also, not only does she lose her power, she I imagine she would die as well. Yeah, it doesn't end up that way. The other two brides die, but that's because they were already dead before the vampire died, because one of them had a change of heart and decided to help the other one, and decided to help the main character against the other one, and... The two other brides end up getting impaled on a spear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. At that point, I was like, really? We're doing this now? Yeah, it's like, at that point, it's like, okay, I'm I'm checked out, guys. Sorry. Oh, fuck me! Mm. This is a reverse... Oh, god damn it, I just realized. What? <laughs> Vampires can only enter places when they're invited, and this is the reverse of that of a vampire inviting somebody else in. Oh. Well done. Oh. Well done. I see you, movie. Quote unquote, <laughs> very clever. Oh. oh. I feel gross for having caught that now. <laughs> <laughs> that. So, I mean, I already. <laughs> You know what? Internally, I was thinking, is like, okay, I already decided I wasn't going to see this movie, but I was curious about what Cody would say about it to see if I could change my mind. It's like, if anything, it did solidify, no, I don't need to see this. I movie. don't know what's worse, that it's basically as bad as I'm describing her that I still don't regret having seen it. I'm not I mean, saying you need to see it, but... <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, that kind of sounds like me and Beast. <laughs> yeah. Would I recommend this movie? No, not at all. D was I upset that I saw it? Well, compared to seeing Fall, no. Not That's at like all. I'm not upset that I saw it. I just probably <laughs> wouldn't see it again, and I wouldn't re recommend anybody else inflict this on themselves. Yeah, exactly. This is a weird feeling. It. it <laughs> Ugh. So I guess that about wraps things up. Alrighty. Because I don't have anything else to say about this movie. Yeah, and I and I don't have anything to add about 3,000 Years of Longing other than, oh crap, all those poor people who worked on it. Yeah, that's... Ugh. <laughs> that's pretty weak. <laughs> that is pretty bad. Hmm. So as far as I could tell, and I'm gonna... I'm just gonna keep checking anyway to see... make sure. But I think the only real new release we're getting this upcoming week is Haunt for Jesus, Save Your Soul. I do actually kind of want to see that. Same! <laughs> it looks like fun. I want to see it more now that you've said you want to see it, because yeah. if it was just me, I I, I would be like, I don't know. But, <laughs> hey, if we both want to see it, and we both want to have things to say about this, because it does look funny. Yeah, it does look like a good time. This definitely doesn't look like a terrible experience to me. <laughs> so I guess I'm good to go see that one. Alrighty. I guess we'll, I, yeah. Next week, Haunt for Jesus, save your soul. <laughs> but in the meantime, thanks so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, follow us on Spotify and RSS. Mm -hmm. And uh, let us know if there is anything you want to see covered. Maybe yeah, there's a secret movie coming out that we don't know about. 
<laughs> Something on the secret movie menu. <laughs> yeah, tell us what's on the secret <laughs> movie menu. <laughs> and in the meantime, this has been Under the Bridge with the Scarlet Troll, a.k.a. Cody. And with Greg, a.k.a. Greg. Yeah. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>